guest, of course, who also directed the English Dub with you on the show, but is also the amazing voice of Yusuke Yuramesh. Let us invite Justin Cook! such a trip like the last the last 10 years or even eight years have just been this like been the universe giving us these opportunities to experience things that we didn't realize were going to be so important mm -hmm. uh, because and I, that doesn't make a lot of sense right now but like when I was working on Yu Yu show, when I was working on Fruits Basket or when I was working on the original Dragon Ball and stuff like that like those we were just working on them like, we didn't think, like, we would ever be sitting in a massive room full of people talking about it or celebrating it together. So it's like, we have memories from those times, but, like, I, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to do these shows and kind of these updated versions of them because you get to kind of go and experience what it was like, and then you know, you know going in how important it is to people and how, and how cool it is. And you remember the experiences more than you ever did back then. People go like, what was it like to play Yami? And I go, I don't remember. I, I, but now, I, we get a chance to actually kind of dive back into that character again and play it again. And just the kind of the tease that we got on that small bit that we did a little while ago, that was really fun. It, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is one of those shows that are so super close. And I mean, my memories, I mean, I'm good with the gun here, I'm sure. But I mean, I've got memories driving around with this guy, uh, talking about the, the subtext behind scenes and why do these why does this character make this decision and why do you think this one makes that decision? I mean, all the shows we were diving into the minutia of why and what for. It's because Justin and I were, were colleagues together. We both were directors and, and uh, for a time, Justin was actually working in the same room that I was working in. And so we were like best friends. We would go to work. And then we'd go back to my apartment, which was closest to work, because his was farther away. And we'd just play The Sims and talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> so so uh, I want to jump into the first question as we start the Q&A. But, uh, you know, Funimation acquired Yu Hakusho Show back in 2001. It originally aired in Japan, though, from 92 to 95. Did you know about this title at all before Funimation acquired it? Uh, I, no, I had begun to hear about it. Uh, because we were looking to acquire it, so that's when I started researching it and looking at it. I mean, Chris at this time was the owner of Dragon Ball Z, and uh, and I was uh, on the side. I was looking for something that maybe I could get to be the owner of, and, uh, and so luckily, <laughs> you owned it, bro. You were so good at that show. And I learned from the best. Justin is, and he didn't learn this from me. But Justin is literally one of the biggest fanboys of things in general. Like, I guarantee you he could have a Yu Yu Hakusho museum someday of all of the collectibles and stuff that he used to, like, acquire back in those days. And that's anything that this guy likes. Like, if he likes a band, he can't just go, oh, I like that song. He's got to, like, research the band by every single album, by every single vinyl, by every single poster, everything rare. Uh, this is the guy. And when he was working on that small bit, uh, that last little OVA right. film that we did, he was literally pulling in bit parts of the cast of people that we hadn't even heard from in like 15 years. He was like, I think it was my mother's like secretary at her, her office who did this bit part of this lady who was walking across the street and he would track them all down, man. He was like, wow. I do like the original voices. Yeah. We grow up with them. You don't want those things to change, right? Yeah. 
So how, what's the story behind like how you both got involved with the actual dub production? It's like, well, uh, the, so the way this started is that our producer at the time, uh, there was, a, if I'm remembering correctly, there was actually an, uh, there was an online thing where they, the internet was not new at that time, but it was certainly not as well used as it is now. Yeah. But we had all done different, you know, there were a bunch of like two or three different choices per character. And they were actually put up online for people to get to kind of go through and make a vote. I don't know that any of it was cast based off of that, but I thought that was an interesting piece of it. But no, we got brought in at auditions. That's really where it was. I was going to be the director of it, but we couldn't find a, a use case. We were pretty solid on Kuwabara. We knew who that was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, but same with, uh, same with Chuck, same with John. Um, and so Yusuke uh, was an unknown, and Barry took me out of the casting. I wasn't able to cast anymore. He put me in the booth and had an audition. And then he came to me and said, we'd like you to be the leader and the voice director for the show. And had to act all cool. Be like, oh, thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> I will take that very seriously. And then got home and ran around the block like eight times. <laughs> and I'm like, you finally got your show. I was so super stoked. And, and I had already fallen in love with this show. I'd watched 112 episodes over the weekend. Uh, <laughs> well, hey, we wouldn't have known Blue Ogre was George, right? Like, you don't find that out until one what? So. <laughs> You had to watch them on VHS tapes like you guys did too. VHS. But yeah, I mean, when we were working on this, I think Chris was still working at the end of Dragon Ball Z at the time. Had we started Blue Gender? Yes, I believe that. I think we'd start, yeah. just started working on Blue Gender too, which is a. I mean, that's another classic one back from that kind of Funimation yeah. era too. So yeah, that's kind of how that rolled. Amazing. So. I want to know, like, as a person who's not only a voice to use game, like, how does it go when you direct yourself? <laughs> it's very, it's very elusive. <laughs> uh, well, I, again, and not to flatter too much, but I learned how to do that by watching how Chris worked as Vegeta Piccolo and, well, and how Chris worked as Dragon Ball Z. And, uh, <laughs> No, but so and so I was watching a guy who was being harsh on himself and listening to his lines, doing a playback, listening to it. Oh, let me grab that one more time. And so noting, knowing kind of where was that moment that you kind of go, that's that's good. If I try to work at it anymore, I'm going to make it worse. So kind of learning some of those ropes. Uh, that's that's how that worked. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Do you, did you find yourself? Do you find yourself today actually being more harsh on yourself than you were back then, or did you find like? Like back when you were working on Yu Yu, or back when you were working on Dragon Ball, you felt like you were harsh back then. I I think I'm more harsh on myself now, even though even more so than back then, because back then, if you wanted to do another take, mm -hmm. because of the weird archaic machinery that we were working on back then, it could mean like, all right, we gotta let the tape rewind for like five minutes or something like that. So. It was, you, it was a very important decision as to whether you were gonna do another take or not. Uh, now, with the, you know, with the technology we work on now, I'm like, no, another, another, no, let me do it one more time, let me do it one more time, let me do 10 more times. Like, I, I'm pretty picky. Directing yourself is a real guaranteed way to have 17, 18 takes on something. <laughs> That's a lot. I'm sure yeah. eventually you'll start dreaming. Just like that, just talking to yourself all day. Another <laughs> difference now, and I mentioned this in the, my panel with Sean earlier today, uh, is that there is, now, there's, there's a, it's a different thing. Back when we were working on those shows, we would record them, and we'd give them to somebody, and then who knows how long it would be till they were on TV. We weren't sure about that, and we didn't really know. Um, but now, we record things, and almost instantly, they're out there for you guys to see and we get this instant feedback and so before we were at this kind of distance from our audience and there was no like youtube or anything like that where you could just like kind of look and see or there was no social media to speak of but now like everything you do is instantly out there and everyone can see it and so i feel uh, a tremendous amount of responsibility to the fan base um almost sometimes too much uh, like but you have to kind of sometimes make the decision like, wait, are the fans determining what I'm doing on this or am I doing things for the fans or whatever? But it's, it's, a, it's a responsibility that we take very seriously. And now that we get such instant feedback, you don't want to screw it up. Wow. That's, True. That's a, that's a lot to take in. 
for sure. Um, so I want to ask, as you guys were both working in the studio at the Funimation office, which was I think at the time in North Richland Hills? That's correct. Yeah, and that's the Flower Mound, Texas. Uh, what did those studios look like? And like you were saying, it took you like five minutes to do another retake. Like, what, how, what did the studio look like back in those days? Has days? anyone ever been to a bank? <laughs> that's what it looked like. <laughs> yeah, it looked like uh, accountant's offices that had like conference room tables on them with old equipment and toasters and microwaves and whatever. It sort of plugged, like, it was just this mishmash of cables. Because back then, Funimation didn't have that much money. I mean, they, they were a budget company back then. They Yes, they had Dragon Ball, but the, it still, you know, it was still kind of in its infancy. And so our, we didn't have state-of-the-art equipment that we worked on. We worked on pretty old, pretty old gear and stuff like that. Made it work. Yeah, you guys had whisper boxes at all back then? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Matter of fact, I think uh, the one that we recorded in the office show when now is, it still exists. It's no longer put together. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's leaned up against the wall. It was a hot. It. it was un air conditioned. Yes. Like, it was, it, especially because it was a bank building, and anyone who in works Texas. in a corporate office knows that, like, it's, like, we had to work a lot of late hours. Anytime it, it would go past, like, 5 o'clock. The air conditioning went off, and so it was. There was no air conditioning anywhere in the building after that. So that is true. Wow, you guys are like really sweating out during the dark tournament. Yes. Oh, wow, <laughs> that's that's incredible. Um, so, like you had touched earlier, Chris, uh, on this, but like knowing that the dub production is much faster now. Um, obviously, Funimation has been doing a lot of simul duds and turning those around in two to four weeks, which is incredible because you know we used to wait years upon years to get dubs. So like. Uh, they're mainly at two weeks. Two weeks. Yes. Justin's the head of production, so yes. you know. that's an important distinction. He has to be true. But yeah, like when you guys were on Yu Yu Hakusho or Dragon Ball, like what steps did you have to take in terms of like knowing what was coming in terms of the story and plot? Because I think back then, obviously, we all of those episodes had aired, and so I like you say, yeah, binge watched one or two episodes, but like. Uh, how did you actually understand it? Because I'm sure it was in Japanese. Sure, but they had, uh, what was it? It was the one where Kurama is referred to as Hiei and Hiei is referred to as Kurama. Anybody else seen any of those? Yeah, right? <laughs> and you, the, you go through a way back and you'll see those. No, it, there was a decent translation that allowed you to understand what the story was, for sure. So, uh, but the biggest difference is that you'd work on six to sometimes ten episodes at a time. So when Chris would come in to record Kobara, we'd actually be able to get through a whole story arc in one session. Uh, and so there's positives to that, but then the, the negatives to that uh, are also that you kind of, it's, it, you know, you book a six hour session and by the time you get to end of hour four, you, you're pretty tired and you're, you've yelled a lot for that amount of time. Uh, so sometimes that can come out in performance, but I think sometimes trying to attack that much material all at once, it's a lot to keep in your head because you're moving through a lot of storylines when it comes to that. Kind yeah. of as, a as a producer, it's great because you can have one actor that has a smaller role do a bunch of roles, uh, like do a bunch of episodes, but as an actor, I, I actually, I love coming in for simul dubs. Like I love coming in for them because you get to see the director every single week. Even if it's just like for a few lines, you still get to see that director, and you feel like you're part of a, a like a current production. Like if you're working on, you know, uh, Walking Dead or something like that, you feel like you're working on something that's being like constantly happening. And I I like the spirit of that more than just like the grind of like, well, we've got another. 15 minutes, let's sort of get into the next episode. Like, if you finish early with the director, you just kind of get to chat or talk about the show. And yeah, and, you know, the other thing also is it makes the dub, I feel, a little bit more relevant. Uh, you know, something like Yu Yu Hakusho, granted in 2001 or no, 2000, February of 2002, people started getting to watch it on television. Uh, but that's eight, nine years after it originally came out in Japan. Right. You know, so having something that's printed out in English and it's, and it's out there either streaming or on broadcast somewhere, uh, a day after or two weeks even after it airs in Japan really makes it A, feel like it's a, a true international release, and then B, it, it does cause that dub element of it to be a little closer to its parent, as it were. Yeah, amazing. Thank you very much for that. Um, was there anything that set you have to show apart from other series that you guys have worked on over the time? Could be story, could be 
you know, arms themes. So this is where we just say a lot of glowing things about you. <laughs> no, I mean, it, I think there's tons of things that set this apart. I also think that Yu Yu Hakusho ended up being, as, long, as well as Dragon Ball Z, an inspiration for a lot of the other animes that we've seen come out over the last 20 years. Um, and I also, uh, I mean, I think that we, as at least employees of Funimation, learned a lot from doing those dubs and Boy Gender and uh, Kitty Grade and Fruits Basket, other shows as well, uh, Desert Punk, that we kind of learned a new method, methodology when it came to dubbing. And even with Dragon Ball Z, as we were able to kind of get farther and farther away from the, the previous cast's uh, version of the episodes, we kind of found our own independence in working on it. And so uh, I think one of the things that set Yu Yu Hakusho apart from so many other titles is that it's really not just a, a show that's encapsulated to itself, but it's also kind of a, a, an interesting history lesson of dubs in America and kind of how that has come about, and then also just a, as the growth of Funimation and how we kind of creatively come to our own. Yeah. I think the thing that was neat about Yu Hockey Show is I think a lot of people found that show, and I, I think like everybody who was watching that show at the time thought they were the only people that were watching that show. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Like, you felt like it was like, it was like your underground thing, like nobody else is watching this show. And, and it's because it was just, it wasn't tr the traditional, um, it wasn't a traditional type of show. It wasn't a sci-fi anime. It wasn't uh, It wasn't necessarily a Dragon Ball anime either. It had like, sure it had a lot of tournament stuff in it, but uh, we, we recently did a commentary track where we, we watched over one of the episodes and I, I, it's been a long time, honestly, since I've watched a lot of Yu Hawk show, and I was surprised how well it kind of holds up. Because the music, uh, while it does sound dated, it still sounds really cool, and it's haunting, and it's like, it wasn't a very clean soundtrack either. It, there was a lot of like hiss in that soundtrack. Oh, it did. Very analog. It was, yeah, very much so. So I, I, I think the thing that makes Yu Hawk show kind of neat, it was kind of like a, if you were cool enough to watch something else besides Dragon Ball back in those days to be like, nah, -uh, this is my show. This is my show. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally guilty of that. Uh, that's why I like Yu Yu Show is like my favorite from my childhood. Like, I thought Yu Yu Show was like, in its own league. But like, you know, of course everyone's like, oh, I watch Dragon Ball, I watch Dragon like, but do you watch Yu Yu Hakusho? And they're like, they're like, you don't wait till like 8 o'clock, dude? Like, it's just like literally half an hour after. Like, come on, man. Like, you can watch it, dude. Um, Season four. Yeah, exactly. Um, is there like a favorite arc that you guys have? My favorite arc has been the chapter black arc. Woo! Yes. I, I, I like the way though that each arc uh, altered the animation slightly. Uh, I like that each arc kind of felt like it was, I don't know, like the show itself was developing. But I like that one the most. I, I, I Robert McCollum working with him. I mean, it's hard to say because it's not like working with Damon was awesome as a Totoro, you know, he's incredible. But I like the different personalities. I like that Robert and I got to kind of define all of those personality types and work out who they really were. Your story arc in the third season is fantastic. Uh, and then all of the new actors that we got to bring in, Justin Pate, Monica Rial, uh, I mean, there was just, and then getting Kai, getting to play video games. That's one of my favorite episodes. Yeah, I don't know, like, the, it's, it's been, for me, working on that show was like, I didn't understand it as well, clearly, as Justin did, because when you're the director, you understand absolutely everything. So, um, I really, I think one of my favorite arcs is when I got to be Justin's daddy. Um, <laughs> there's a lesser known fact to also play Ryzen as well. Um, yeah. I played... Oh, yeah. Mark wasn't in season four, so... Yeah, why not? Why not? Um, yeah, I love... I, I really dug everything involving uh, like Yukina and Aikichi and like this this whole weird romance thing he was happening towards the end because it's something you wanted for him so badly. It was like such a fun thing and then of course it had to be Hiei's sister as well. That was awkward. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no thank you please. <laughs> I have a sword. <laughs> I was told about you. Stand up, stand up. Look at this cosplay. Can you all see him in that? Come up on the stage for just a second.
Dude, Justin, you were right. We were backstage and Justin's like, there is the best Kuwabara cosplayer out there. Look at him go! Just real hair. Yeah, that's, that's some darn good hair you got there, buddy. It's very, it's very aggressive hair. I can't, I can't, I can't. Oh. It's haunted. It's, it's terrible, I, I swear to God, I can't, I can't. Well, it's nice to meet you, what's your name? Brian, Brian Hawkins. Brian, give everyone a round of applause. Man, yeah. the inscription on the back is perfect, it's yeah, so good. It's incredible. Did you actually stitch that yourself? Did anybody cosplay as older brother Tagoro? We could get the fight going on right now. <laughs> oh, okay, it's lucky this time. Lesson on fact, guys, did you know that older brother Tagoro, uh, played by Damien Clark, is also the voice of Handsome Jack in uh, Borderlands? Yeah, just fun fact for you there. That's amazing. It's true. So, uh, as we kind of reminisce more about Yu Hakusho, especially Kuwabara, and, uh, and it's just, yeah, there's amazing moments from, you know, any of the arcs that we have, but I think one of the best parts about um, Kuwabara in that chapter Black Saga is just, there's that really intense moment for him. And so, uh, I'd like to have the lights down, and then also I'm going to play this clip. Oh, yes! This is, big. you guys don't do this enough, especially in, like, classic, like when we're reviewing kind of classic stuff, I love. Be Are you about to play like an old scene? I am. Hold God, on. I love that so much. That makes me so happy. Bring the audio up, so please be aware.
producer to me is going like, all right, we need, that needs a new mix. Like, I, I need to do some pickups, uh, it's, but it's too late for that. Oh my gosh. Yeah, only 17 years too late. Yeah, yeah. Man, I, that scene, I don't know if any of you started feeling it, but I'm, I was watching it, and as soon as he's working to get that sword and that music kind of crescendo right there, I started getting some chills, oh, yeah. quite frankly. I very much remember that. Oh, yeah. I actually remember, did, now, if I'm not mistaken, back in those days, our computers were so cruddy that pulling lines from previous episodes was like almost impossible. Like, Are you sure you re-recorded each yeah, one? Yeah, that's why so many of them sounded like so similar and like they weren't mixed that differently to sound like it, because it sounds like one long... I don't know that you did them all together. We'd have to look at that. I'd be like, I'd be take a look, but... Whew, that, was, that was a scene, man. Like, the, playing that character was tricky because yeah, it's kind of a dumb voice. <laughs> and they're making him sound like he really is affected by things and has emotions. It's like, really? That was really hard to do. I will, I will say, and I thought you did it brilliantly, but that is incredibly yeah, hard. Me, Thank you. I was trying to do one of those wacky voices and, and also evoke an emotional response. Is, that's, that's double duty there. We were all learning so much, though. We were all still really young actors and young people back then, uh, and we were still at the we were at the end of Dragon Ball. We were still like, for the most part, at the beginning of our careers, for sure. and we were still learning. And I heard I heard Laura Bailey's voice in there for a split second. You guys all know who Laura Bailey is. <laughs> uh, she is somebody that she had a critical role in this. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, yeah. Was like, Oh man. But we we all learned so much. Like, I learned so much as a, an actor just by watching her work because she was just, she just came in so strong and so brilliant. She's just such a phenomenal actress. Amazing. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. That was like a montage oh, you know, of the past of his, you know, his whole development. So, of his greatest hits. I mean, yeah, yeah I exactly. Have, I have not heard that episode since, like, the mixer pulled me into his room and was like, you gotta hear this. So <laughs> that's exactly hey, bro, what it makes sense. Sense. <laughs> And it totally has like that iconic background music, you know? And I think that and I may be wrong about this, but I do think that's actually the first time that particular piece of music was used. It was for that because that's the first time we see what is it, is it called the Kakai sword? Can someone check me on that? Chicken toe. Chicken toe. No, chicken toe. toe. There the chicken toe sword. No, it's <laughs> not the chicken toe. <laughs> Well, of course, we can't just have a clip for Chris, so we have a clip for, actually, oh, yes. Justin as well. Uh, this is a really amazing uh, So that last clip is from episode 89. This one's going to be from episode 65, so if you actually memorize where the arcs are, that's towards the end of the dark tournament. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, this is this will definitely refresh both of your minds and everyone else's. So it's, it's, I think you have to moments when it can be really funny, and I think this is one of the best moments from the show, where they're like, Comedy's totally played right into it, so uh, we're gonna play the clip now. <laughs> the strength to save him. He was just too dumb to know how to reach it. The hell do I say to that, huh? You say you learned. Shut up! What good does that do? He's already dead. I can't say anything to him now. Is that so hard to get? I'm just like everybody else with power. I don't do anything to help. <gasps> I'm sorry, Kumara. It's all my fault. <laughs>
seen something cringy, that is the expression that you have. Right there. <laughs> so I think this is one of the funnier plot twists. I am totally guilty of following and like, I totally believe that Quo is dead. Uh, I was one of those kids who was like, oh my gosh, he's dead, what's gonna happen? Um, and, and of course, you know, there was the plot twist that happened, but I was like, is he really like actually alive? And I didn't really believe it uh, for a while until he obviously got back up. And so uh, I wanna ask both of you, like, what is your memory of like, like, when, when you discovered Justin, when you had watched the episode, like, were you shocked? Were you actually thinking like he had actually died or? No. I'm gonna, well, no, so when I was watching it, when you're, and you all know this because we all live with Netflix and Amazon Prime now, so when you're binging something, you don't have actually, and by the way, this is why I hate binging things, but when you're binging something, you actually don't get to have that feeling, mm -hmm. you know? Because you don't have to worry, you just watch the next episode, it'll tell you. Um, but seeing it once a week, then it changes. But I can certainly say that when Chris came into the booth, I'm, I feel somewhat certain, and I can't remember this for sure, but I feel somewhat certain that I was letting him know right from the start, you're faking this, you're not actually you're not here. Um, and a big reason for that is because, you, well, obviously there's a scene where he says it, uh, you know, so we're gonna be, he's, that's, that, that'll be popped for him eventually anyway. But exactly. I'm gonna be able to play it that way as well, so. Yeah, because you, you have to keep that character so you out of the loop to loop, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that was, this, those two clips is what I wanted to show to you, both of you and kind of just reminisce, because I think. Dude, thank you. That's, that was, I love the fact that you just did that. Because a lot of times we'll come up and we'll talk about stuff we've done, but like kind of all watching it together is, a, is, is sort of special, because I'm sure a lot of you had, it's been a while for many of you since you've seen that scene too. Kidding? All these guys are on Hulu. Funimation.com. They're binging it right now for the fourth time. Has anyone here like watched this series like over ten times? Everyone in the front row now is doing some sort of confession. <laughs> like, I don't know all the DVDs. Like, yeah, I have every video tape on. I have every video I've memorized. It's all on my phone. So, yeah. This is the You Have Show support group. <laughs> <laughs> this guy back here is like, I'm watching it as you guys are talking. <laughs> you guys are playing this. <laughs> is there a villain from the series that you feel like defines the show? I think there's pretty good villains in the show. There are great villains in the show. So, but, but because of the way you worded the question, in my opinion, there's only one answer to that, and it would be Sensui, as he was one of the previous spirit detectives. And that's ultimately where the storyline is kind of driving to, is introducing us to the lineage of the spirit detective. Yep. That's my opinion. Man, I might be talking about the same person. What was the, the, the first, I remember the, I don't remember the character's name, but I remember the first character that like, terrified me was this like clown looking dude. What was it? Suzuki or Suzuka. Uh, and it was voiced by Jeremy Henry. Yeah, dude, that character scared, that character gave me nightmares at the time for some reason. I don't know why. It was really creepy to me. Was was it, what was his thing that he would say? You've got to memorize. I'm beautiful. Don't ever pronounce 
pronounce my name without using beautiful in front of them. Yeah, in that Inman. Oh, I love him in that. <laughs> Jeremy Inman was the voice of Android 16 in Dragon Ball Z, by the way. Yes. Oh. Yeah, no. And is actually now a voice director at Funimation. If you like Tanya the Eagle, is that the name? Yes. He I, I, voice directed that. It was yeah. absolutely fantastic. He's yeah. and Copcraft, I think he's working on right now. That's correct. Yeah. So, uh, is there a personal favorite moment from the series? And if so, why? Uh, there's a, a little piece of conversation that happens right after uh, Yuzuki K and the gang during the third season take out the doctor who is voiced by Sonny Strait. And this is a little like one of these powwow moments where they're kind of strategizing what to do next. And for me, just as the voice director for it, there's about, mm, I think there's probably, well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, at least nine to ten characters in the scene. And the way that conversation flows start to end is just one of my favorite directed moments because, again, you got ten characters and all the lines are feeding perfectly into each other until it gets to the end of the scene. So it's not show related, I get it, but just as far as like favorite moments in the series, yeah. even when I go back and hear it, I'm like, oh, that was a good piece of conversation. That was a good one. That was yeah. the one good one. <laughs> For me, the thing that really, st I guess, stands out the most to me was really just the very, very beginning of the series, oddly, because that was probably some of the most memorable stuff, because it was, you know, we had Dragon Ball, and it was doing its thing, and then we were doing kind of uh, the blue gender thing, which was a bizarre, kind of odd sci-fi story, but like this, like even back then, it kind of felt like, oh wow, we're getting to do something kind of cool again, so, and it was a, such a vastly different voice from anything I'd ever done before, so there was a lot of, it was a lot of hard work at first, with Justin and the producer both going like, Make him a little dumber. I mean, not that dumb. Like, like a little tougher, but like a little deeper, a little higher. We recorded episode eight six different ways before yeah. we finally decided how to take the show. There was like a Super Y7 version. There was one where we changed, like, yeah, like it wasn't Spirit Detective. We were Ghost Detectives. Do you remember? Ghost Files. We went through and did this whole thing where there was like a completely different version that we softened up from that. I think there was different voice actors in one version. I mean, so we just kind of of, and that's something to be said that I haven't seen that's happened since, is that there was so much attention to the show's dub by our producers and, the, and again, and uh, the Coken Hours, really everybody who had invested in this thing were very invested in its success. So there was a lot of hands in the pie, as it yeah. were. So yeah, the beginning is certainly very memorable, just for how many times we had to do it. And then if someone's waving something at us back there, I don't know what that means. This is time's up? Is that a time's up? Oh. Oh, man. Oh, man. Sorry, I didn't know. I, 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 I legit couldn't read it. Don't don't kill the messenger. Kill her. I'm just <laughs> Before we head out, I'm gonna just ask you guys to do two just last few words for the fans and joining us here on the panel. Yeah, do the voice, idiot! <laughs> I'm listening to it here and I'm thinking, you know, Yusuke's grown up a little since <laughs> Sperry, oh my gosh. <laughs> Sperry gun! <laughs> yeah, that was the end of the fight. That was the end of the fight. Uh, thank you all for coming for our panel. And uh, come see us tomorrow when our swords get longer! Yeah.